Hi everyone, I'm Mike Bithell, director of Bithell Games, and you're listening to Goddamn GameCube. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Goddamn GameCube. Greg and Riley are your hosts today. We have an awesome guest in the virtual studio. You may know him from his previous games, Thomas Was Alone, Volume, and The Solitaire Conspiracy. Please welcome Mike Bithell, the director of the new Disney game Tron Identity. Mike, how you doing? I'm very good. How are you doing? Hey, let's do this. We're excited. So firstly, uh, when mm. did the conversation about Bithel Games developing Tron start? Any interesting anecdotes? <laughs> That's a loaded I've question. Been a, I've always been a big... <laughs> ultimately, the audience will decide interesting, I guess. I can't really make any promises on that. Um, yeah, so I think it's a weird one. It, it often is the case um, that you kind of, you circle people for a while. And we I've been talking to uh, some folks from Fox and from Disney, pre-Fox becoming part of Disney. So I've kind of been chatting to people in those areas. And then when those kind of got merged, uh, some of those people started working together, I think you know, my name came up in conversations and we started like officially talking, but it's, it's one of those things where it's just, you know, lots of conversations forever, like me essentially just pitching idea after idea for like thing I'd like to do uh, in all of the worlds that those guys have. And then uh, Tron specifically came up and, and they wanted to talk to me about that. And I'm a massive Tron fan and just kind of clicked together, um, which was really cool. But yeah, it's, um, so it, it kind of, yeah, years and years and years we started chatting, but, in terms of like seriously no though let's make this i think that was a, a couple of years ago okay and um i don't know if you can answer this but was there any crossover yeah. between john wick hex and tron identity both games adapted from film similar people mm. similar contacts or unrelated no they're, they're definitely definitely related in the sense of like say the people so i think that's like the a lot of team overlapping but um specifically i would say the big overlap there is uh ben who's uh my external producer um, who I'd done, I'd worked with on John Wick um, because he was, a, at that point, he was working um, at a publisher and they wanted to kind of see what they could do with John Wick. Um, and and he put my name in the hat and we kind of started that conversation. And then after John Wick, me and Ben did have like lots of conversations about like, well, what's, what's next? What do we want to do? I'd liked, I'd enjoyed the kind of working on the license game thing with John Wick and we, we'd done well with it. So I, I kind of had that conversation and then, yeah, he definitely was like really essential in putting together that kind of Tron and us thing. Um, because it is just one of those one of those IPs and those franchises that I just always wanted to kind of do something with and, and felt there was amazing opportunities within. So yeah, just kind of finding that and doing that has been you know, massively cool. Moving on, uh, so Tron does not have many pop culture releases since its inception in the early 80s. Mm. Like Tron Legacy, known most famously for its Daft Punk collaboration, received a mixed mm. reception. So let me ask you, like, why Tron? Like, what, what drew you to want to create something in the Tron world? Because there isn't much Tron out there. Mm. I just, I, I, think, I think, to be honest, the fact that it's not a billion different movies was part of the thing that kind of did draw me to it that there were it felt like there were these big opportunities it's a big kind of mythic story you've got you know the 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 first the first movie is completely playing with like transhumanism and big sci-fi concepts and the second movie legacy is is more concerned with i would say more concerned with uh kind of the relationship side of it that kind of mythic relationship between uh flynn and his son and, and, and all of that's always sons but if you consider clue a son as well and there's all these interesting layers to that so for me it was this in this this canvas that like i felt like there were a million stories you could tell and the kind of to me the 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 signpost that kind of showed that to me was um tron uprising which was an animated show uh, that came out um, around the release of Legacy, I think just after the release of Legacy, which was basically them taking Tron and doing episodic television with it. Um, as, if you've not seen it, beautiful like animated art style, it's gorgeous. Taking that and kind of exploring that world in that bigger context to me demonstrated that there were just so many stories you could tell in that world and so many approaches and ways you could play with the, both the science fiction of that, the philosophy, the kind of 
like I said, this kind of mythic fantasy layer that's there with Tron is kind of just, it can kind of be anything in that way. It's a, <clears throat> Tron is almost it's a vibe and you can kind of put that vibe in lots of interesting places and kind of link yeah. it up. That's yeah. where yeah. like with identity, like, like film noir and Tron just felt like chocolate and peanut butter to me. Like it felt like there was a real opportunity there and kind of, I wanted to play with that. And as we continue to play with Tron stuff, which is what we're doing now, it keeps coming up. It keep we keep going. Well, but what if you combine Tron with this idea? Oh, that's amazing! And you kind of roll from there. So yeah, I think that was that was the big one. And and then yeah, just just genuinely walking out of Legacy in 2010 and just be have been like having my mind blown by the visuals and the music. It's weird. The Daft Punk soundtrack genuinely didn't review, I think, very well at the time which is wild. If you go back and read like the contemporary reviews of that soundtrack, I think most people now would say that's like in the top 10 soundtracks of movies ever, or not yeah. most people, but a lot of people, I think I would say that. Yeah. I, I think, I think there's a real, um, it's really surprising that at that point, Daft Punk were thought of more for, for dance music than they ultimately ended up kind of being. It's just, it's just, it's, it's interesting how that kind of shift happened. Um, but yeah, I think I think yeah, I think Legacy holds up, and and the original movie holds up, and Uprising is genuinely excellent. And then of course the other layer to this, which is video games, you've got all these video games that have happened in between as well. So yeah, so there, there seemed to be a really good foundation there, and a way for us to tell really cool stories and pick out the things that were already there in the franchise that we, we just were very excited by and kind of loved. And so following up on. Um some of the philosophy uh, that you mentioned, mm. like when I sort of look through your history of games, like I see a through line, like from Thomas to circular to Tron, like the idea of, you know, AIs feeling emotions, feeling human, <laughs> yeah. experiencing freedom, that sort of thing. Like it, it, like, am I correct? Like, is this a concept that's meaningful to you? It seems like it, but I've kind of drawn that through line myself. No, I think so. It's one, it's one I wasn't necessarily conscious of. But yeah, AIs have been a massive part of our stories. I wasn't conscious of this until quite recently, until I think it was around the time where I was looking at Tron and thinking about whether I wanted to do Tron. And I can't remember, I think someone even said to me, like, but most of your games are about computer programs and AIs in some way, <laughs> robots or... And I, I, I don't know what that is. And I've done a lot of introspection on it. I've been like, because I think there's definitely an element there of I love to tell stories about characters who are uh emotionally different than humans and i think that's something that is appealing to me i don't know where that comes from or why i'm searching for that but it seems to be something that keeps recurring maybe i don't think of myself as human or something i don't know where that, where that comes from. <laughs> but like there's there's a there's an interesting kind of uh, something there um i think as well though it's the classic sci-fi thing of sci-fi is an amazing way of kind of talking about things with via subtext right by via, via the ability to kind of you can have a big conversation about a very important interesting controversial strange thing and you put aliens and robots in it then you can <laughs> get away with murder and right. i think that's like as a kid like watching star trek say and just seeing all these stories that spoke to me in ways that that you know kind of it felt like they'd snuck in these messages or they were talking about things that were that were interesting to me in a way that was accessible and safe because of the sci-fi wrapper that it was in so i think there's a certain part of that i've i've found sci-fi time and again and, and computers and robots are a very good way of doing this um like a, a, an interesting kind of layer you can put on stuff to talk about talk about things that maybe i wouldn't want to write something very kind of realistic or mundane about but sci-fi gives me a way through that and the other thing the other cool part of sci-fi speculation is being able to go <clears throat> okay well here's a weird setup where you know let's let's assume ais exist what could be how could that manifest what would it feel like for a computer to have a bug you know what would it feel like for you know how, and the stuff that we play with an identity that's definitely like extrapolating what um what being a person in a computer would actually be like and what the limitations right. of that are and what are the unique kind of experiences that could come about as part of that so that's also exciting to me is kind of going on those those thought experiments um and then finally just being a history nerd and being able to take stuff that is very human and, you know stories and things that happen in human history and apply those to these kind of sci-fi settings as a fun transposition and kind of a fun way to explore those so 
I love I love the I love the playset that sci-fi gives me basically. And, and yes, I do go back to robots a lot. It's a hundred percent a thing. Uh, yeah, so I'm correct. Uh, so yeah, you're correct. Like, so that was a, I could I could stream my mouth. You're right, for Greg. You. Are you happy? <laughs> yeah. Is that what you want? Never say two words when five thousand sentences or two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's funny. All right, so let's get into the uh, down and dirty details of the game. So let's do it. Yeah. Um, so uh, Tron Identity is described in the press as a visual novel. Um, mm. Do you have? Uh, did you have any other like genre gameplay prototypes in mind during early development, or were you set on the visual novel style from the beginning? I think for Identity, definitely that was kind of the the absolute down the line kind of solution. There, we wanted because we we uh, well, I mean, when we were first starting out, we hoped, we knew, we 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 dreamed that we would be doing more than one thing in Tron. We knew we wanted to kind of we wanted to get something done. We wanted to introduce the characters, the player to these characters in this world. We wanted to kind of ease people into Tron because we were also very aware that like there's generations for whom Tron hasn't been in the pop culture, right? There's generations for whom Legacy was, you know, we're too young to watch Legacy and there's not really been as much since. Um, so we knew we kind of had to reintroduce Tron as well. This was going to be a lot of people's first experience of this world. Um, so for all those reasons, like visual novel landed very early as like, well, we'll do the classic thing. We'll we'll do a detective story to do our world building, right? It's Blade Runner play. I've used it in a couple of games as well. Like it's it's a very cliche thing of if you want to introduce a world, you make you make the protagonist of that story someone who gets to ask a lot of questions about, oh, what's that? Sure. Um, and yeah. you can kind of do your world building via that. And that that kind of detective story. You know, we had circular, we had the circular games, and we we knew how to make those stories. I knew how to write it. We the team knew how to kind of build a game in that way. Um, and then on top of that, the kind of the puzzle aspect we'd done with Solitaire Conspiracy. So we felt because I love the there's a scene in Legacy where they're fixing a character's disc. I love that stuff, and I wanted to put some gameplay around that. So so it just kind of that kind of kind of came together and and, and worked well. It's not necessarily how we'll do all the Tron games, but for this game, that made that made the best sense, I think. Um, Mike, I have a question for you, very tangential. Um, mm. Are there any um, visual novel games in particular that inspired Tron Identity or that you're just in general a fan of? I'll be honest, I'm massively, massively ignorant of the genre. <laughs> Despite oh, okay. making three <laughs> games of it. No, to, genuinely, like my, my go-tos, the stuff I'm most inspired by and trying to kind of pass through what what we do are oh, like the telltale games or you know mass effects or you know bioware's kind of dialogue systems those are the things that i'm trying to make i'm trying to make a small version of those rather than a big version of kind of more traditional visual novels i think that's that's been my way into it but yeah i am amazingly ignorant of visual novels as a genre I, I i've played the phoenix wright games and love those but i don't oh, yeah. know if you would class course. those as a visual novel really that's sure. that's kind of a stretch um but i i'm very aware that i'm ignorant and i need to play more of them because like i've made a few now and it's kind of it would be like it would be like make, being a platform game designer and never playing mario like it's like <laughs> i don't fully <laughs> sure. i don't know but but I, I do think i do think that kind of that that kind of lack of <laughs> that lack of perspective that lack of knowledge of the genre i think in a weird way does free me from a lot of cliches i think i kind of i can make stuff that feels a bit more unique but yeah i do i do need to if i'm gonna make if i'm ever gonna make a fourth one of these i i should probably play some visual novels. <laughs> wait wait before before you continue mike please tell me you've played the walking dead season one at least oh yeah no i'm saying like telltale so would you so i guess maybe i'm being too specific with my thing would you call walking dead uh, visual novel. Wow, he's turned a question on us. I might be being too specific. So when I when when you when you ask the question of visual novel, so yeah, I played. I love all the Telltale. I played all the Telltale games. I love those. Um, I played a lot of games in that kind of genre. But to me, that's something different than visual novels specifically, which tend to be a lot of romance sims, um, a lot of um, text based stuff. I think the only, I think the only visual novel, visual novels I've played have been, yeah, Phoenix Wright, and then there was um, the Vampire, the Masquerade, some massive vampire fan. They did a couple, which I think I played one of those, Coteries of New York or something like that. That was good. Um, that was interesting. Um, beautiful artwork, I remember that. Um, 
so yeah, but I don't know if you if, would you consider Telltale games like visual novels? Because I think that's if you if you broaden it to that, then yes, I played lots of visual novels. Really yeah, I question. mean, I would say yes, but you get but it's not on rails, right? You get to walk mm-hmm. around, but it more or less is, right? I think. Yeah, I I, I think you're right. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I think I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so you touched on this a little bit about there's a sequence in the movie where it happens, but I was curious if you had any particular. Um, inspiration for the uh the data defragmenting mini game i really wish you could have seen us try to figure that out we were it's take uh, you a little while i think we, we, we maybe <laughs> didn't i think there's a there's maybe room for a better tutorial there potentially um i've watched a lot of streamers once you get it i think people people really enjoy it but like oh, that, yeah. that, that learning process so yeah it's based on it's based on a there's a i can't remember i think it's called waterfall there's a solitaire game variant oh which yeah, is played yeah. similarly to that yeah. Um, that was kind of the starting point, and then I, I, I got a, um, I got a, I think it's a, it was a, it was a, a, a marble board, which is like a, a circular ring, and I, I, I prototyped it with marbles on like a wooden board, and that was kind oh, of wow. playing with that and figuring that out was fun. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, but basically it was it was coming off of because we've done Solitaire Conspiracy, which was I think a really successful kind of Solitaire game. I'm really proud of that game, and I wanted to do something else in that vein, but kind of abstract it a little bit further away from Solitaire. Um, and then of course we knew the radial element, obviously of the ring, and kind of making a game that was focused on that. So it was kind of looking at kind of classic Solitaire variants that were in that vein, and then just kind of extrapolating. But yeah, I think there was some, there was some, uh, I think it was a bit of a learning curve on that on that game. But some people, some people just click immediately with it, but I've definitely oh, seen yeah. some people take a little bit longer to figure that through. We got um, there yeah. eventually. It was just a little embarrassing with three guys that we were trying to, you know, I wish somebody could defragment my own data disk in real life, but uh, that's the way it goes. <laughs> need, I think we all need that. that was the, 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 honestly, the biggest one with that was explaining to the younger members of the team what defragmenting a disk was. Oh my God. I didn't even think about felt. that. Yeah, I had to when we were when we were putting it together. I remember like uh, working on working on that kind of coming up with the concept and and yeah, so just uh, someone someone on the team who's a bit younger than me kind of asking what defragging of this was. <laughs> it's a whole a whole world that's changed since uh, every since, couple of months. We used to do this, but and oh yeah, this was, uh, this was a whole part of my life was watching those little blocks fill up. <laughs> yes. Oh my god, um, oh, wow. Riley, do you mind if I follow up on this just for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Mike, no, I, I didn't have this as a part of the script, but I'm curious now hearing you talk about it. What was the impetus to have the puzzles be skippable or having like the uh, if you needed help solving them, the game would give you a couple of like a, the game would give you like three moves for free. Was that yeah. like you like uh, uh, like we really want people to see the whole game, see the story if you want to skip it? Was there any like back and forth on the team? Like, no, puzzle solving is a part of the game. You got to figure it out. Or what was there any back and forth yeah. there? It was no, that was a big conversation. I, I think the, the the initial obvious reason for it was just we know people are going to want to play this. We know we're putting a puzzle game into a genre, into a into a story based game, and there's going to be a lot of players who don't care, who just want the story. I mean, we didn't want to kind of block those players from having a good time with the game. So that was right. definitely the kind of the the starting point for it. Um, in terms of like was there a conversation it definitely was in the sense that there were definitely people um who who were like well this is you know you're you're skipping gameplay you're skipping the this is it's a you know it's a puzzle game like you say and and to them i kind of I, I basically made the argument of like well then i think people will play it you know if people want it they'll have it if they don't they don't um right. i'm a big i'm a big believer especially with this one in particular that we should try and make games that are accessible once someone's given me their money I'm going to just try and entertain them as much as possible. If they want to fast forward through the bits they're not enjoying as much, cool. By all means. You, <laughs> by all means. Yeah. And it's it's something I think that I think there is a bigger, there's definitely a bigger conversation happening in games around this specific area right now. Um, about around like accessibility and whether we whether we want to whether it diminishes our creative vision to do make choices like that. But for this game in particular, it felt it felt right. It felt like giving those players, and we've seen, we've definitely seen that in feedback. We've seen a lot of players who are like, oh, I don't play puzzle games, but it's cool because you can skip them. 
and they're having a good experience with the game. And then I'm also seeing people who love the puzzle aspect and are just playing that. And then through the main menu, you can go and play like an endless mode of that puzzle as well. So they're they're having their experience too. And and it's it's satisfying to serve both audiences on that. Um, so yeah, that, that was the that was the main kind of the full process there. Um, we were bashing to get the two genres that we knew there would be audience members who didn't want to play, you know, half of that. Um, okay, so uh, next question. We so we actually, I believe the two the two of us had never seen Tron before, so we watched both films pretty recently, and it was nice. a real shock. Yeah, it was it was special. It was a special experience, and it was a real surprise that um, it's the very first one is a Disney property. So mm. I had a question about lately. It seems like with their larger intellectual properties like Marvel and Star Wars, they seem pretty committed to preserving storyline continuity like for instance mm -hmm. a creative couldn't necessarily and there's pros and cons to this as well like they couldn't necessarily just say oh i want to make an incredible hulk movie it's like you know the hulk needs to be here at this time etc and mm -hmm. so you touched on this a little bit earlier since tron has a considerably smaller i guess narrative footprint did you feel a bit more freedom to tell the story that you wanted to or, or i don't know i mean so without getting into spoilers there are some pretty big lore implications that this game mm. drops and i was curious where you can comment at all if this plays into maybe the company's plans for a relaunch or something like that so i definitely can't do any of that i can't talk about anything <laughs> to do with <laughs> what mickey is up to um no I, I um no so i can't i can't i definitely can't talk about anything that disney's got upcoming or what they're doing um but from my perspective it was Yes, there's obviously an opportunity. There's more. There's more canvas to paint on for sure because you've sure. got these spaces. It's not. It's not like stepping into a Star Wars and or a Marvel project and going, okay, this is. There's all these stories that went before. This is. You can do the essential research on working in Tron in yeah. a day. Like you can right. get through all of the content. <laughs> you can see everything. You kind of. I can and 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 running Tron School became a thing the company does. Like when someone joins the team first day is go experience every piece of Tron media basically just go and go and see all that right. so that definitely that's that's cool I would say though I think from my perspective coming into this and wanting the freedom to do whatever I wanted was not the goal because if that was the goal I just I would work on my own stuff and I wouldn't yeah. I'd, I'd create new IP for me it was it was it was uh there were opportunities there that I hadn't seen anyone take advantage of so there were stories I saw as available and possible within Tron that we could kind of go and do and, and you know, explore some new ground, essentially. Always building on what was there before, always building on threads. There's, there's, a whole, there's whole plot points in Identity that are basically me really liking a sentence here or there in one of the movies. Like there's, um, yeah, there's a specific, I think it's a line in the original movie about uh, like religiosity and the relationship to the user. And that's like a massive chunk of identity is exploring that and kind of yeah. going in and digging into that a little bit. Um, so that, so for me, it was always about pulling out things that were interesting. Um, but of course, as you'd expect, there is obviously a back and forth with Disney, you know, everything I'm working on there, they're checking over, they're working with me on. And, and we had those conversations around war and about what, where I could push and where I couldn't and where those right. lines were. Um, and it's, you know, it's ultimately, it's a collaboration, um, between myself, between Disney, between like the creators of Tron and all of that stuff. And, yeah. and those, those, those kind of ideas are flowing back and forth. So it's it's constraining in the sense that obviously you're you're trying to show respect to everyone else around the table but it for me it created more opportunities than than hindrances like there was there was there was a cool opportunity to do interesting stuff there so i feel like it sometimes so yeah. helps you focus right kind of keeps you on the track <laughs> i guess i love it i i genuinely like adaptation like even volume is like an adaptation of robin hood which is an right. ip obviously no one owns but it's it's a franchise robin hood yeah. is a an established kind of storyline right so i i like i like that because you can kind of reflect on it you can kind of bounce off of it you can presume certain knowledges from the player even people who've not seen tron have a knowledge of what tron is and kind of you can kind of play off of those expectations i like what you can do there and then what you can subvert and play with and where you can nudge things so there's just yeah, I've, so I, I'm, I think that's, you know, that was it's also what I liked about working on John Wick is there's just these opportunities to kind of play with with mythology, essentially shared mythology. 
Um, but yeah, no, it, it was cool. It was fun. I've uh, I continue to have a lot of fun with Disney working on this stuff and pitching them my wild ideas for what I think Tron should be doing. Um, and uh, I can share like five percent of those conversations in public, which is fun. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Yeah. So the next question. Um, so the game has no voice acting. Was this an artistic right. choice or did it come down to budget, resources, scope of the project? It's every video game. That's those are every choice is made by every single thing you listed, right? Um, <laughs> I, I think no, we, we never planned to do voiceover and we didn't in that was honestly as much a carryover from the circular games as anything. It was one of the lessons we learned on the circular games is um having voiceover can be very constraining and kind of can make you force you into choices from a writing perspective that are trickier and kind of limit your ability to do kind of branching. So, so for example, I think identity, the script for identity is novel length. So it's, I think I can't remember how many words it is, but it's tens of thousands of words. Like it's a substantial, uh, very substantial kind of uh, script and, and a bunch of text that's working there. It feels like even more than that because we can use, um, language we can have fun with language to kind of imply even more breadth of it so the, the example i always use from subsurface circular um is you know you, you if you run into a character in subsurface circular um and you have the option to be either very friendly to them or very argumentative and annoying to them right you can make those choices and you can kind of express yourself uh in terms of how uh, in terms of the dialogue you have with that character and then later on you meet another character and they say, oh, I saw you talking to Steve earlier. He loves you. In text, that he loves you could be sarcastic. It could be genuine. So you basically, you are feeling the game reflect back to you your actions. Because as a writer, I'm, I'm using the ambiguity of I love you as a, as a way of kind of adding depth. That's not possible when you're doing VO. Um, you can't, you can't you'd have to record two versions of that with different intonations from the actor. Right. Likewise, if a character, if you're talking to a character and they become angry at you or sad because you told them something heartfelt and then you have other dialogue with them later, do you record two versions of that? One of which where they sound like they're calming down after being angry or one of which where it feels like they're kind of coming to terms with something that made them sad. It's all of these considerations can lead to this very robotic thing you see in a lot of games of voiceover where a character is like really angry at you with one line and then back to completely normal in the next. And that kind of mismatch and that kind of um, a kind of uh, uh, whiplash, emotional whiplash that can occur with characters is something that I've always tried to avoid. And I think with Circular, it demonstrates to me that the better version of this is when you've got the voice in your head. And we can kind of we can do more and we can and we can take you down a weird garden path with a script because because me writing a word costs very little um it's a very straightforward process whereas me having to then go and get that bo'd and thinking about those processes kind of becomes very quickly something that's like insurmountable as like a production process so yeah that that was the that's the thinking behind it i I'm not sure that's the end point of that conversation because we definitely keep having this conversation internally of like, it'd be really cool if we hear voice though. Um, and I think one day we'll work it out. Uh, I know other other studios do it. There's 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 the thing as well with visual novels in particular where maybe they'll voice like some lines and then give a put a voice in your head and then move away from that. We've talked about that as well. There's other ways of doing it, but for us, um, and, you know, I, I feel like our writing is better without voice currently. And so we'd have to kind of consider how to, to achieve that. Oh, gotcha. Right. But I, I'm definitely not closing the door on that because I, 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 it's definitely, it's, it's one we have lots of chats about internally for sure. Sure. Um, on the subject of branching paths in Tron, mm. uh, how did you balance that aspect of the game? How do you make each choice seem viable? Like, was it heavily play tested to see if other choices are more common than others? Any examples of game scenarios that had to be changed because pe everyone was making the same choice? Um, I, I pref I, I'm not, I don't, I don't really mind if most people make the same choice. Um, that's, that's one that if anything, cause it makes it so much more entertaining when someone makes the other choice. So there's, for example, there's <clears throat> there's a character, I'm going to try and say this without spoilers, there's a, there's a character who appears in the story and you as a player have a choice to kill that character almost instantly. Like they appear 
and uh, you, you two played the game, so you'll know exactly who I'm referring to. Yeah. They appear, and very quickly, with no ambiguity, you're given the option to kill that character. And most players, because we're, you know, human and kind, and thoughtful, and we want to be, we want to have a good playthrough, choose not to kill that character and have the experience that, that, that flows from that point. But the 10% of players who do kill that character <laughs> have some stories to tell. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, and honestly, I'm, I'm 100% cool with that. So I, I don't, I don't massively play test our stories or I, do, from, from that perspective, well, for me, what I'm looking for in play testing is, did you feel something was unfair? Did you think something was surprising in a not entertaining way? Did you feel that the game misled you or, or made you make a choice that then, it's okay to have surprising outcomes, but did you feel the game was unresponsive? Did you feel that, that, that something was misinterpreted? Were you Was there a moment where you wanted to have an option that the game didn't give you? Got it. Um, and those are the ones I'm trying to, I will branch out in that way. And there's, there's several points in the game where, um, where there's like, you know, where there's three choices in the version we released, but there were only two choices in the, in the first draft. And someone said to me like, Mike, you're not giving me this path, which I absolutely would choose in that situation based on everything that's happened up to this point. And we'll back to that and we'll build it. But it's it's great. One of the very, very early on, like when I've made the first draft, and with the first draft, it's it's just text-based. Like it's just basically playing a text adventure game and shared that around my team. Um, I was on a call where two people got into an argument because they had because they both made different choices and they were so convinced that their version it was like oh well if if if, if i'd not made that choice the game would have still steered me towards this outcome and they were arguing point blank about events that were completely separate like scenes that they a scene that they'd seen that were completely different to the other character and that was the point where i realized okay though this is working um but there's definitely there's definitely imbalance in choices like I, and I th i'd say that's true of most choice-based games if you look at like the, what the games that expose that data to you most choices in like a telltale game you can see like a 60 40 or 70 30 split you right. i don't know if the optimum is always a balance there i think actually an imbalance is usually an indicator that you're doing something more interesting um and that that the player who goes down the less walked path is going to evangelize and be intrigued by that. And I think as well with this game, one thing that I massively underestimated going in um, was how much people were going to replay the game and try those different paths. Um, and fortunately for us with this game, there's there's good different, meaningful differences between playthroughs, basically, if you do different things. Um, but there's definitely like a desire. Very few players play identity through once and are like, yeah, I'm happy with that. That everything went how I wanted it. I didn't mess anything up. Uh, that's the that's the locked-in version. I'm, there's lots more of players kind of playing with their choices and kind of actively participating in that, which which I like that kind of that co-authoring kind of feeling that that gives you. So so yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy with that aspect. Um, now, are you able to gather data on which choices players make now that the game is released? A little bit. We we don't do full on analytics. We've never really done that. Um, but we do have the main way you can do it is by um, achievements. So you can like go oh, on achievements because we put achievements on most of the mega choices in the game. You can kind of go, oh, that many people did that. And um, what's interesting is the mega achievements also, or the mega choices, sorry, not shown via achievements also demonstrate what I'm saying in terms of like that people go back and play multiple times because the numbers don't add up. So you can see, oh, actually, sh wow, a lot of players are actually going through a second time um, more than you'd expect. So yeah, it's. Um, so we can see that. And to be honest, in most cases, it's going exactly as I expected. Like there's definitely a lot of choices in the game where there is kind of a morally, quote unquote, morally good option um, that, that players would lean towards if they're just going for, I want to be a good person that everyone likes. But as you'll find in the game, the game doesn't necessarily reward you for making those choices. And actually there is more nuance. And I think that's one of the reasons people go back and play it is, is that it's, I like, I think it's a game about the separation of intent versus outcome and kind of uh wanting to be a good person doesn't necessarily make you a good person is definitely a theme that i'm like intrigued by you know and, and i can see bleeding into the writing there. for the next question it, it's uh it's similar to to what you what you just said so it seems like uh the main character's like oath to truth, not making decisions is purposely broken as a part of the plot. Now, um, is that some sort of like fourth wall breaking irony because this is a game founded on making choices? Is that like a little bit tongue in cheek? Can you talk about like the intentionality of that? Yes, I mean, a little bit, like a little bit for sure. Like if it's kind of classic 
uh, classic narrative, right? Of you have a if you if you have a character who you know is going to if you're making a, a movie that you know is about uh, someone who bakes really good cakes, you do need to have the main character of your story start off as someone who thinks that baking cakes is for losers. I'll never <laughs> bake a cake as long as I live, <laughs> and then they go through a journey where they learn the importance of baking cakes, and they kind of. Come to terms with it. So there's a little bit of just kind of hack writing there of like, well, I'm, if the main action the player does is X, then I need to put them in a position to start where they're somewhere else, um, just so we feel like we're seeing some progression with those characters. Um, I think as well, though, there's an interesting, um, there's definitely an, an intent on my part. And I try not to talk too much about these kind of things because I, I prefer people just kind of play, play the work and, and come to their own conclusions. But like, there's definitely thematic stuff there about, um, impact and about kind of making choices and curating information and, and, and how you make choices and how you have impact and and different philosophies of how you should do that and how you how you kind of handle yourself in that sense um so i think having the main character have some level of conflict with that is interesting i think as well there's um you know you know some of the some of the uh discussions and debates that kind of the original tron invites in terms of like who tron is and fighting for the users and what is a user and and these kind of things also play into that and kind of so putting it again a character who's a character who starts in a place of not uh being motivated to interact but comes to realize that they should interact yes absolutely works in, a, in this context and kind of fits um so yeah, it was. It came from that. So it's, I wouldn't say it was irony so much as just giving the character some room to grow. Because there is a risk. There's a very big danger when you're making a game that's about uh, choices, about player expression, that your protagonist, your avatar, can feel very empty because literally you're, you're stepping in, and you're giving them their choices. So by definition, their motivations and their character growth, um, there's a real danger that that just goes out the window because actually it's it's Mike expressing myself when I play, right? It's not them. They're not making these decisions. They don't, they're not growing or learning because I'm not growing or learning. I'm playing a video game. Um, so having a, finding a layer for the, for the character to experience some growth while the player is making the choices, that's just adds a little bit of extra texture for me and, and some detail. And like I said, it's also in conversation with the themes of the, of the game, conversation with the themes. When I start talking about my stuff that way, that's horrible. I hate that. No. <laughs> that's, that's, this is why you don't go to university, kids. You start using phrases like that in conversations. About. Um, so for this next question, if you'd prefer not to answer this, I'll kick it to Riley for the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a favorite choice or scenario, or would you prefer to keep the spoiler free? No, I'm going to step back from that one, because I, I do like them, but to explain why I like them would probably take us down a path I wouldn't want to go down. So yeah, no, sure. I, will, I will leave those as they are. Sure. Um, uh, Riley, yeah. go ahead with the next. <laughs> Yeah, so this is another one. It's going to be kind of walking a tightrope, I guess. But we, yeah. we had some thoughts as we were wrapping it up about dangling threads about mm. we're like, is this setting up a sequel or something? And I, I just, it led to another thought I had where something I've noticed for games like um, the Walking Dead Telltale series or um, Mass Effect, for instance, they seem to often struggle with accommodating each story branch that you create as they make sequels and how mm -hmm. they and essentially like it's like a multiplication, like each one leads to five different ones. And that creates issues where it's like we need to get everybody back on the one path or it's it's yeah. creating problems. Do you think is this maybe inherently problematic uh, concept? Do you think maybe like choose your own adventure games are, are best left as a one and done? Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm, this is, this is tight ropey. Because we're <laughs> obviously doing more Tron stuff. So I need to be very careful with what I say. <laughs> I, I think there's a few, I think there's a few answers to it. I think as in a lot of things, I think it's about, it's, it's about, exp I think you can also, you can do expectation management. So you can yeah. say, so I think one of the things with Mass Effect, for example, was everything about that game was emphasizing that your choices would carry over, would have big meaning or full consequences. And I think the frustration players felt when those consequences weren't maybe as substantial as they'd hoped or they didn't see the impact of their choices so much in the world, that led to, you know, a backlash and a frustration. So I think there's partially it's that. I think there are things you can do when you're writing stories to make choices local. So making choices matter specifically to the story you're currently telling, but have 
certain fixed points. So in identity, for example, and this is something that I feel pretty strongly about, like mystery stories, the mystery you're uncovering doesn't change based on your choices. What's going on, the truth behind the scenario, that is static. So that is not going to be influenced by any means. What's what's being influenced is your relationship to that information and the, all, all of the characters around you. Exactly. Um, so, in, so that kind of that helps a lot. I think if you were if you were a protagonist, if you were an action protagonist in Identity, where you were shaping the world, that would be more of an issue, right? But actually, yeah. the, if you think about the meta outcome of where the story ends. It kind of your choices mattered because they mattered to you and they become asked to the character around you, but their story that can carry on from there is relatively um untouched or is is kind of influenced by that but but kind of carry over. I think as well though, I think there are arguments for playing with the idea of maybe making, you know, when you're making sequels, like setting them in a specific branch of choices. Like you could go making a Mass Effect spin-off where you were locked into if the player had done X, Y, Z. I don't think that's necessarily yeah. bad and wrong as long as you're playing with that and exploring that and having fun with that. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure. I think, yeah, it's definitely a challenge if you want to make a straight up, you know, sequel or follow up, which continues on the specific emotional story you were telling in the first thing. I think there are other ways around that and other paths, though. And that's my very vague answer to that question. Yeah. Um, but I, <laughs> I found it fulfilling. I, that's, I got what I wanted. <laughs> good. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so I'll be funny here. Uh, I'm not going to ask you this question. Um, what's, what's the canon ending, Mike? I'm not going to ask that. <laughs> we're going to just move on to the next segment. Well, is um, there, do, you, do you feel that there is one? Do you feel that there is a, to you, a canon ending? Uh, yeah, I, I, I know what I think the ending of the game okay. is. Okay, okay, good. Oh, I, oh, there you go. A little, a little spicy, uh, a little spicy dangling yeah. there. I like that. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we're going to get into uh, the ending segment here, Riley. Why don't you uh, take it? Yeah. Um, so tying into actually a question Greg asked earlier a little bit um, mm -hmm. on the subject of AI, since we've discussed it a little bit already, how do you feel about um, recent AI developments, um, mm -hmm. both with respect to, to to working on games, games development, um, artistic expression, and society at large? I know this is a huge question, but uh, do you? <laughs> yeah, so it's a whole it, podcast. Yeah. It's it's a whole thing. But yeah. do you have any general opinions or feelings, you know, positive or negative about the subject? Would be great to hear. I think the tech's really interesting and fun. I, I like play. I've played with some things and looked at some stuff. It's 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 interesting. There are immediate kind of ethical concerns of course. like you know around around uh, plagiarism and and it using art without permission etc or text without permission i think there's i think my two short-term kind of concerns are my concerns are not that the world's going to be ended by skynet i have no concern about that right. i think the immediate the immediate concerns i have looking at this stuff is a uh, the replacement or mistreatment of workers in the, in the short term by short-sighted management. Like I think there's definitely there's a lot of jobs, and we've we've seen this in the blue-collar industries for decades. How yeah. you know ro robots in factories or self-service kiosks and shops. Like we've seen this this automation of you know and, and disruption of jobs in that way. And disruption just means breaking stuff basically, which yeah. which, which is which is a problem. And I think that's going to continue. I think mean, there's a lot of jobs currently which could be badly replaced by AI, AI as it currently stands. And that's going to lead to some stupid people firing workers, which I don't like. Yeah. I think the other, the, the other concern, which is more nerdy and wankery is, <laughs> is it's being lied about. It really annoys me that it's being lied about and overstated. Oh, yeah. You're looking at essentially predictive text. You're looking at, you're looking at when you're typing a message in your phone and you write, I love, then you're going to get the suggestion to say you next. That is not your phone expressing emotional truth. That is your <laughs> phone making a guess based on the data it's seen that most people say you after I love. And that's it. And I, I, I as a nerd, am constantly annoyed by the misrepresentation of this technology as anything beyond that. Right. The, the idea that this is able to think of things, create things, do anything of interest or artistic value when it is literally only able to guess the next word in the sentence. It can't, it's, <laughs> the, 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 this is, I'm not the first to point this out. It's so bad at telling jokes because it can't know what the next sentence is going to be. Right. You can't structure a story. You can't tell a joke. You, 
need context of what you're saying in the whole in order to say anything. And I yeah. think that means that means it's 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 just rubbish. I, it's a very interesting. There's a there's a good there's a Michael Crichton anecdote. Here you go. Here's a Michael Crichton anecdote for you. Um, he um, there's a story he used to tell about reading newspapers and that he was an avid newspaper reader. He would read, um, he'd just yeah, get the paper every day and just read it cover to cover. And he'd always skip the entertainment section because he talks to movie assholes all day. He doesn't want to read that shit. He wants to read right. about the events of the day. He wants to read everything, everything except his industry. <clears throat> and one day he, for whatever reason, did read the film section of the, of the newspaper and about the movers and shakers of Hollywood and the story. And he read that page and it was nonsense. It was absolutely, it was ill-sourced. It was rubbish. It was absolutely, absolutely didn't gel with his understanding of what the industry was and like had just omissions and, and problems. And he said it ruined newspapers for him because he realized that the thing that he knew all about was rubbish in that newspaper. And it made his ability to take seriously political analysis, say, much yeah. harder because he it, it had recontextualized that for him of like, well, I, this read like it was true and important and interesting to me until I read the same format applied to something I knew about. And I feel AI is very similar. AI is an amazing Dunning-Kruger test device. I sit in front of AI and I see it like, I'll listen to like a piece of uh, a song that's been generated with AI and I'll be like, that almost does sound like a Drake song. And that's because I'm a shit musician. That's because <laughs> I have absolutely no taste whatsoever. I don't know what I'm talking about. I see a... Uh, two paragraph story written by an AI. I mean, that's the worst, like that a child could write a better, more interesting story than that. Or, a, right. you know, I'll, I'll see a piece of like high resolution fake photography made by AI and I'll be like, that's pretty good if you ignore the teeth. That's like genuinely quite impressive. But I'll <laughs> see fingers. like a piece of illustration or concept art and I'll go, this is useless. You can make, right. you can make this, you could, this isn't art direction. This hasn't, there's no value. It's again, it's just a really good, if you ever want to find out if you're good at something, go and find the thing you think AIs can do well, because that's the thing you're shit at. And you don't realize it. <laughs> like that's the thing that you're ignorant <laughs> of. And I think that's uh, the, that's, that's what I keep coming back to. And I, I, I get it. I get why it's exciting. I do find it exciting, but to me, it's an interesting parlor trick, which is currently being described as life. And that annoys me because it's not, it's objectively not smart enough or it's, it doesn't have an opinion. It doesn't know what a dog is. It just knows everything that's ever been said about dogs. <laughs> it doesn't have any value. It's 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 Google essentially. It's a it's a it's, an, it's a search engine, and that's yeah. and that has got value. And and when I've when I've the the values the uses I've found for AI have been asking questions that would be hard to Google essentially. So like, can you give me twenty examples of X Y Z? that's genuinely useful and sometimes will generate useful results that can kind of streamline a thought process or, or a bit of research or whatever. But even then you've also then got to go and double check all of that because maybe it just invented a, a, a study because again, its job is not to go and find you 20 documents about a thing. Its job is to convincingly give you what it would look like if someone were trying to give you 20 examples of a thing. Right. So yeah, that's my view on AI. I, I wish we'd stop calling the current predictive text thing AI because it's not data, you no. Know, in the in yeah. the sorry, in the yellow uniform on the Starship Enterprise sense. So at last time you were on the show, we talked a lot about Metal Gear Solid Two. Okay. <laughs> so so you you don't think we're quite there yet? Is it, is from what I gather? <laughs> I think. Well, I think no, we're totally there, aren't we? On a lot of stuff. In terms of, yeah. I think that's that's the beauty. That's that's and it goes. Here we go. This is a full circle. This is satisfying. This is the kind of narrative uh, endpoint that AI could not figure out, right? The thing we were talking about right at the start, or I was talking about right at the start, where I was saying that sci-fi lets you talk about human truths, basically, via an interesting filter. Metal Gear Solid 2 is absolutely right about where politics and culture have ended up in terms of, you know, memes and stuff. It, I mean, ultimately, a lot of that was stuff that was that Hideo Kojima was drawing on a lot of thinking that was happening all over the place back then, but still, it's it's incredibly insightful about the human condition and where we've headed as a society and how information flows and isolates and brings us together and all of this stuff. And he put some silly sci-fi AI stuff on it because that's fun, because it's cool. It makes it interesting to a teenage Mike will actually sit and play that game rather than if you if you told me it was about like, you know, human society, I would find it less interesting. So I, I, I think I think Metal Gear Solid 2 is absolutely true in what it's saying, but absolutely fictitious in the way it's conveying that story. And I think that's absolutely fine. That's what sci-fi is. You know, you're not. You, it's 
in the same way as like you know it doesn't matter that we've not made hoverboards it doesn't matter that the, like <laughs> the the stuff like star trek has explored around kind of queer theory for decades sure. and often yeah. decades before these things were being talked about in quote unquote civilized society right it doesn't matter that teleportation will never actually get invented that's not the point the point is that we can use the teleportation to talk about what it might be to experience something that you can't talk about in the current yeah. moment or you or that you anticipate we will be talking about in the future that's the value of sci-fi and so yeah so Mel Gibson to absolutely spot on in its predictions about humans and yeah. absolutely nonsense in its predictions about everything else as it should be it's science fiction <laughs> That's great. So uh, we have we have a couple of fun questions left. Um, oh, fun. I would like to go around the room and ask what everybody's favorite Daft Punk song is, since we were talking <laughs> about them earlier. Um, <laughs> if I had to, I'd say Giorgio, because I think I just love the. There's so much love in that song. There's so much respect and admiration. That is that is two nerds talking about how much they love <laughs> a dude. And that's I think a that's great, great choice. Yeah. I, not like musically, I, it doesn't set my heart on fire, but like the, you can feel the admiration and respect in that song. Like, that's Very the, geeky. The yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Nothing Riley, Greg? before before you, you'll answer this one last. I feel like, like, maybe like eight years ago, I would have said like the Julian Casablancas collaboration, right? Uh, in instant crush. Yes. Yeah. But now I think <laughs> it's kind of boring, but I feel like if you asked me that a couple of years ago, I would have said that. But what's your answer? It's it's definitely one of those that that depends on the day. I really liked the song "Touch" on the last album. That was mm -hmm. a great one, very moving. I was also like the track "Human After All." Of course, that's a that's a that's a Stone Cold classic. But yeah, interesting group. Sorry they're gone, but uh, great great soundtrack for Tron for sure. Um, so yeah, uh, my last question, um, Mike. I don't think we even brought up that um, this is this is actually your second appearance on the show. Mm. Thank you very much for coming back. Uh, great Pleasure. interview we did with you a couple of years ago. I think two years ago now. Where does mm -hmm. the time go? We have. No I was probably idea. trying very hard not to say the word trom the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I didn't even think about that when you were doing the interview in 2021. You were probably in the throes of I was Tron. 100 percent working on Tron. Yeah. yeah, that's the fun thing going back. The amount of lies I have to say. I've said lies in this interview. Um, <laughs> like 100 percent because because you have to because you can't say about what you're you know, working on next. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like the the amount of like going back to old interviews and being like, oh, that was clever. How I've I didn't lie. I don't. I but I avoided that question Omission. quite nicely. That's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. a mission. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we, I mean, we were discussing um, a lot of your previous works, including uh, John Wick, and we were talking <clears> about <throat> the movies. And I was going to ask you if you had a chance to see the new one yet. I did. I loved it. That was really it's, good. I know what you're going to ask me. I was just I was just curious if it's is is because we we agreed I re-listened to that episode we agreed that the second one was our favorite at the time do you still feel that way how do you feel yeah. I think it would dev for me it would be two one four three probably that's my exact order as well yeah it's, like in it terms was, of yeah. but it's it was very like it, it's only not higher because two and one exist exactly and, yeah but then with with three like with three specifically I think probably three i like the ultimate spoiler experience because i read the script in an early right, draft right. i fell in love with scenes that they shot and didn't make it into the movie i saw early cuts of it with completely different stuff in it i don't know how detailed i can go with that but like significantly different story in early drafts of that movie and in, in early cuts and then saw it in the cinema like at the end point of all that so i'd seen three like i i yeah it so I, I won I don't think I would have ever enjoyed three. I don't I think three was always the <laughs> that was my job basically was, was yeah. working alongside three. Last time you said you were too close to it, I believe. That was those were your words. You were too yeah. close to three. You yeah. don't you don't I I'd I'd had the chat with Chad about how interesting he was in both in underwater ballistics before oh, I saw okay. the movie. So when when that bit where he's like using the gun underwater happened in in three, I was like, oh, it's that thing Chad was talking about. Like, <laughs> that's not what you're meant to think about in that moment. You're meant to right. be thinking about the movie and that much fun. Yeah. Like, and, and, and four, I was really worried going into four that I would still be in that mindset. And it's definitely still a thing when you're watching like, like fight scenes and like, John Wick takes out a guy who I did stunt training with. So I like, oh, that's a guy. Oh my God. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> like there's still those moments or like where there's like a shot where you're like, oh, that's that's a shot that we talked about with that. Blah, blah, blah. Like 
there there are going to be those moments, but I did still I, I went back to enjoying it as a fan. And then just I mean the the the, the, the scene with um with um, Charon's death with uh, with Lance Reddick, like oh my god, like, he just passed away, and like I a week loved prior, working. yeah. Yeah, me and me and me and Ben, the producer, were in um, we were at Disney World um, when it, and like looking at our phones when this story broke because we worked with him and, and Ben worked with him and some other stuff as well. Like, just just a really great person, and that's so watching that scene like where he dies on camera was just like Jesus Christ, Real. that's too raw. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's um, I I like that I'm back to enjoying John Wick as a fan. I was worried. Because sometimes you, sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes when you're sure. too close to something, it just the love doesn't come back, you know. And I think that was, I'm glad, I'm glad that's come back with John Wick. That's cool. Hopefully that'll be the case for for Tron as well. Hopefully it doesn't. I see. Happen. You see, <laughs> like there's something different with Tron. I think I don't know what it is with Tron, but like I went to, so I was at the, uh, I was at the launch of the, the opening new roller coaster in Florida, um, which is great. And I got to go on that um, before it was open. So I actually got to go into like the ride queue and all of the areas around it were just empty. Like I was the only, me and me and the group I was with were the only people who were in, in the ride, right? So like right. I got to experience that in a way that you never ever get to experience any of that stuff normally. Um, and I was a nerd, I was just fanboying everything. I just loved it. <laughs> It's incredible. It's like they've made a theme park ride based on my video game. You know what I mean? like, it's like, this is incredible. Um, so I think I've managed to I've, I've managed to stay a fan on this one. And I remember on John Wick when I was in the trenches working on it, that dissipated. So it's an interesting. I don't know what that difference is. I don't know if it's just that like Tron's maybe a little less busy or a little. I don't know what it is, but it's it, it feels. It feels good to be a fan in the room on Tron right now and to have a front row seat on all this stuff and to be meeting the people behind it and all that stuff. So that's really cool. So, um, Mike, this is my final question. Um, so we, uh, our latest tradition on the show uh, is that mm. we have our guest intro the show. Uh, could you do the honors for us? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm completely unprepared for this. I do not have uh, the script in front of me already. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Bithell, director of Bithell Games, and you're listening to Goddamn GameCube. That was wonderful. Was Thank that you good? so that was much. Radio, that went a little radio voice on that. Floor. I love that. Right, That's right. perfect. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, hey, listeners, I'm Mike Bithell, and I'm excited. <laughs> um, so, everybody, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, Tron Identity is available now on Nintendo Switch and PC. Go play it. And that is going to do it for Goddamn GameCube. Thank you guys so much. Cheers.